very warm welcome to each and every one of you. We're slightly low on numbers this morning because it's the summer season, so lots of our family and teachers who've gone away for holidays are holidaying elsewhere, and we often welcome visitors who may be trickling in late if they're struggling to find us. Um, so do look out for any visitors coming later. Um, we gather this morning to worship the God of heaven and earth, and we come at his invitation to pilgrims who are on our journey home. But pilgrims are often tired and weary. So hear these gracious words of the Lord. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest, Jesus says. Come, he says, all you who mourn and long for comfort. Come, all you who feel worthless and wonder if God cares. Come, all you who are weak and fail and need strength for our journey home. Come all who are lonely and find a saviour who is closer than a brother. Come all you sinners and find a saviour who will embrace you. And come all you doubting and struggling and find a gracious Lord who will strengthen you. So that's the God we worship this morning, the God who came to seek and to save the lost. So I'm going to pray and then we'll stand and worship him. Let's bow our heads. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we praise you, the God who delights to give and to welcome us, but to whom we can bring nothing. So we come empty-handed this morning, in need of strength, in need of mercy and grace, in need of your forgiveness and cleansing. So we come before you now in Jesus' name and ask that you would enable us to glimpse your glory once again this morning so we can leave here praising you with all of our heart and mind and soul and strength. So Lord, we thank you we can come before you as the leper did unclean, as the blind man did unable to see, as the little children did longing for, to receive your gifts and as a paralytic did, helpless. So praise you that you welcome us helpless sinners as our prophet who speaks words of life, as our priest who mediates for us, and as our king who leads us in battle and reigns victorious. We pray this in your name. Amen. Well, we're now going to sing Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of My Heart. It's an arousing hymn, so hopefully it's a good one to get us in, in good voice this morning. So as musicians start, let's stand and sing together.
Well done, do take your seats. We've just sung in that penultimate verse that riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou my inheritance, now and always. Thou and thou only, be first in my heart. High King of heaven, thou tr- my, uh, my treasure thou art. But if we're honest and take a look at ourselves, I think we soon realise that's probably not a true reflection of our hearts this week. If you're anything like me, the High King of heaven hasn't been my treasure this week. We probably sought earthly riches or man's empty praise rather than giving that over to God. We've turned from the Lord, our creator, and made idols out of just about anything. And we need to repent. So we're going to do that now as a church. We've been reading Romans in RBT over this month, so I will use Romans 3 as a bit of a handrail as we do that. So let's bow our heads. I'm going to read a verse or two from Romans 3. And it will take a moment to reflect in the quietness of our own hearts and think through what we need to repent of. Then I'll lead us in prayer. Romans 3 says, There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Father, your word is sharper than a two-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of our heart. So when you tell us that no one is righteous, not even one, that includes us. Each one of us here are utterly undeserving of your grace and mercy. Even this week, our hearts have turned to idols rather than to you. As Romans says, our speech has often been far from life-giving and Jesus-glorifying. And your verdict is that our throats are open graves, our tongues practice deceit, the poison of vipers is on our lips, our mouths are often full of cursing and bitterness. And we know, Father, that it's out of the overflow of our hearts that our mouths speak. Our actions have fallen short of your standard, let alone our thoughts ultimately because we don't fear you rightly or submit to your king. So, Father, we confess that we've fallen so far short this week. We repent before you now and ask you to forgive us, to cleanse us and to wash us whiter than snow. Please help us through your Holy Spirit to change our hearts and to sanctify us. Thank you for the assurance you give us as those who confess. Say in Romans 4, blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against him. Thank you for that assurance you give us as we confess and for your saviour who forgives our sins. Amen. 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 Well, it's great to be able to come back to God with kind of having cleaned the air, having asked for forgiveness and We're now going to stand and sing together how great is our God, that God who saves us so willingly. So let's stand and sing.
Well done, do have a seat. We'll just run through some of the church notices so you're aware of what's going on in the next couple of weeks. And I mentioned at the beginning, we're in summer routine now, so there's no youth group tomorrow night, there's no time for tots on Wednesday morning, and there's no Sunday school this morning. So the Sunday school team have prepared an activity sheet. The priority goes for children, um, but there's some spares at the back. Um, if you haven't got one yet and you'd like one, um, there's more at the back by the sound desk, and you can slip back there during the next song. Um, so if the children are staying in, they're looking for six key words to the sermon, which are on the board at the back, and they need to tally up how many times Mark says them. Um, and then for those who manage to complete the sheets or have a, have a go at completing the sheets, there are some mystery prizes here in the boxes. So I won't, you won't be disappointed. You might be. Um, and um, if the children can bring their sheets up at the end of the service, the Sunday school team will be here, and you, they can show you their sheets and then... Um, maybe have a lucky dip into the box. Um, so that's going on during the service. Um, other things going on. So we've got the, uh, the service this evening. Pat's preaching on Romans 5. Yeah. Romans 12. Yeah. Romans 12 tonight. So that's at half five for refreshments here. And then um, it'll be six o'clock in here for church. So uh, do come on to that. Um, we've got the prayer meeting this week on Wednesday evening. So that's at half seven here in the church on Wednesday night. Um. Um, so church prayer meeting this week and later in the summer we have the Christian um, camp in Wales, CCRW going on and as a church we're going to try and contribute some cakes um, for that ministry for the children whilst they're away camping those cakes could be either homemade but absolutely no nuts apparently there's um, a nut allergy on the camp um, or shop bought, but they, they need to be here in the church by 1 p.m. on Saturday, the 3rd of August. So if you'd like to contribute a cake, it'd be really, really welcome for the children camping. Um, if you're going to make your own, just make sure the ingredients are listed and please no nuts in them. Um, if you've got any questions, Sharon has more details, but Saturday the 1st, um, sorry, Saturday the 3rd of August at 1 p.m. is the deadline for those. Um, other things coming up, so the men's breakfast, we're taking a summer break, so we'll regather again on the 7th of September. So that's uh, uh, the first Saturday of September. The ladies' breakfast, I've got the 17th. Um, 17th of September? Uh, no, we're the following week. Following, mu- following week? Yeah. Great. Yeah, but we're having a break over the summer. So. Okay, so men's and ladies' breakfast having a, a summer break. Um, and then in August, sorry, in October, I mentioned last night in a men's group, there's a Southwest Gospel Partnership Men's Convention. It's a, it's a Saturday um, in Bristol. It kind of runs from nine to about four in the afternoon. A couple went last year. It was really, really good. Um, if you want a link for that, just to scope if you'd be, interesting, you'd be interested in it, let me know and I can send that to you um, personally. But that's going on on the 5th of October. It's a really good day out with um, a guy called John T. Alcock leading the main, main talks and he's, he's absolutely superb. Um, RBT continues. So we're finishing Romans this month, and then next month we're leading to the Minor Prophets over August. Um, if you need some details, Mark or I can send those on to you. Um, another email coming out this week, so, so look out for that. Um, and in terms of some church family news, so Colin is still in Hereford. He's still on a Y ward, um, seeing an OT this week. Is that? Okay. Okay, so do keep praying for Colin. It's been a long time in hospital and um, his care needs are are, are fairly significant. Um, And Lydia Hale has also had a fall off a horse um, and really damaged her leg. So we'll be praying for her shortly. She's in hospital today, waiting for a CT or an MRI scan, maybe both, to work out next treatment. But it might be an operation to put plates in. Um, She's on morphine, so the pain's under control. But do pray for the Hales as they look after Lydia and work out her next steps. Um, Because she has planned for doing some some more riding. Um, apart from the noise, apologies for that. Let's just bow our heads and pray for. You just say you missed out next lunch, which is taking place. I'm sorry, Jane. First of August. So let's lunch isn't taking a break. It's not taking a break. It's, it's happening on the first of August. First of August. Good. Thank you, Jane. So let's lunch. Does everyone hear that? Is happening in August. First of August. It's continuing. The stalwarts are not taking summer break. That's great news. Um, thank you, Joan. Are there any other notices I've missed before we pray? Can I just give an advance notice? Of course. Messy, uh, our next messy event, which is on the Please 29th do. of September. 
great. Twenty ninth of September. Thanks, Shirley. Um, the great events. It's worth putting a diary now to, to keep that that Saturday free. Um, well, let's just bow our heads and pray. I think we'll pray through uh, four things this morning. So, firstly, teachers and our children's and youth work. Um, secondly, the CCIW and other camps going on. Then we'll pray for the government as they settle down with the new cabinet, and finally ourselves as a church. Let's bow our heads. First, Father, we do pray for our teachers and our children's leaders as we enter this summer holiday season. We pray that it will be a season of rest and refreshment for them. We pray that you'd refill their tanks emotionally, physically, relationally and spiritually. We pray that each one of them will abide in you and put their roots deep down into your word so that the fruit of your spirit might flourish in them during the summer holiday. We also pray for safe travels. Many of them are away at the moment. And grace as they adjust to the holiday routine, particularly with families, and that's often disruptive. Second, Father, we pray for the Christian camp in Wales this summer and the abundance of other Christian youth camps, holiday Bible clubs, beach missions going on this summer. We pray for the children to settle quickly whilst they're away from parents and for safety as they're conducting the sports and activities. We pray, Father, for lots of fun and laughter as they deepen friendships. And we ask that your word would be taught really clearly and faithfully by the leaders. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Father, we thank you for everyone who's giving up their time to serve those camps this summer as they seek to bring your good news to the children and youth across this country. Thank you that in your eyes, those tired and weary messengers who share the news of your victory have beautiful feet, even if the world despises their work. Please encourage them that their labour is not in vain. Third, Father, we pray for your, uh, well, our government, your government too, and especially for Keir Starmer and his new cabinet. We pray that as they establish policies, that they'll be seeking to protect the most vulnerable, to punish those who do evil, and to reward those who do good. We pray especially, Father, for their abortion policy, that they will see the unborn, made in your image, but who can neither speak up for themselves or defend themselves, as precious in your sight and deeply vulnerable. We pray they wouldn't continue to trample on religious freedom as Christians across the land seek to challenge some policies and warn those at risk or pray in public. We pray for them as they review the overmatched justice system, that they'd make wise decisions about how to deal with convicted criminals. We pray as they review their foreign and defence policy this summer, that they'd make winsome decisions about dealing with hostile states and violent extremists. Pray especially that they'd use their power and influence to frustrate Putin's wicked schemes and to bring this 10-year war in Ukraine to a peaceful end. And Father, it feels like we as your church are entering some alarming times as some leaders further erode biblical values in this country, religious freedom, freedom of speech and conscience, respect for the gender that you've assigned, and established at conception. It feels increasingly like we're in exile. So please help us as your church to stand firm, to let nothing move us, and to always give ourselves to the work of the Lord. I pray for Christian MPs in Parliament to shine like stars, to have the courage to challenge and debate and vote in ways that seek first your kingdom rather than their own. I pray for the work of Christians in Parliament to encourage and build up a remnant in the Palace of Westminster who can stand firm and commit themselves wholeheartedly to you. Finally, Father, we turn to ourselves here at Wellington Chapel and we pray particularly for Colin with his care needs. Pray for patience and grace for him. Pray for insight for the 
the staff to know how to look after him, especially during his move. Pray for Lydia today in hospital. We pray, Father, that those scans might be conclusive and give good direction as to how to care for this really damaged leg. Pray for the Hales as they look after her too. And as a church, as we embark on our time reading the Bible together and finish Romans and begin to turn to some of the minor prophets, we pray that your word would be sweeter than honey, be more precious than gold than much pure gold. Pray that as we work through RBT and home groups and individuals that you'd revive our sleepy souls, you'd make wise our simple minds, you give joy to our restless hearts, give light to our blind eyes, and remind us that there's great and lasting reward from keeping your law. And we pray now as we come to hear your spoken word, that you would give us soft hearts, hearts that would obey your commands and long to follow you, the good shepherd. We pray for Mark as he preached this morning and Pat this evening, that you'd use them powerfully. We pray all that for your name's sake. Amen. Amen. Well, if we turn to Acts chapter 6 now, I'm going to read the passage out before we sing, and then Mark's going to come and preach to us. So in Acts chapter 6, from verse 8 to 15 this morning, I'm reading from the ESV. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freed men, as it was called, and of the um, Cyrusians and the Alexandrians, and of those from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with, C- with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly instigated men who said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes. And they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. And they set up false witnesses who said, This man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And gazing at him... All who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Well, that's the word that Mark's going to be preaching to us this morning. But before he does, let's stand and sing, by faith we see the hand of God.
Thank you, David. You know sometimes you get prepared for something, then a distraction comes along. It's fantastic to see you guys here this morning. And baby Beatrice, what a joy. What an answer to prayer. So, wow, it's just fantastic. So privileged are we to have a God who hears and answers our prayers. Amen. Let's just pray before we start and get my head back in the game. Father, we, we do thank you that you are a God who hears and answers our prayers. We do thank you that when we call out to you, we cry unto your name, that you listen to your people. Father, we have cried for many months over this situation with baby Beatrice, and you have answered our prayers so kindly. But Father, now as we look at your word, we pray that in some way you will take away from our minds those answers to those prayers, and that we will just think and concentrate on this passage in front of us now. Be with myself as I pray that I will put across clearly and plainly what you've asked me to speak on, and that you will help us in our hearts and minds to do the things that you've called us to do. So we ask it in and through our Saviour's name. Amen. Amen. There is tea and coffee afterwards in the uh, room at the back, and also some plums as well. You can have some plums um, here, or take some home from the, uh, the hatch as well, um, from the last couple of days from our garden. So Acts chapter 6 and verses 8 to 15. I have to say something to you and a confession, and it's not that people won't know this, but I have a terrible memory. I'm sure that most people will know that I forget things so easily and I've forgotten things in the past so quickly. You ask any of my family members and they will tell you that my memory is absolutely awful. Even to the point I have to confess, and Sharon does know this, that I can't remember what her wedding dress was like. I know, shock horror. But some things I cannot remember and they're just, they're just gone from my mind and I can't recall them. Family holidays is another one. But there are a few things that I do recall. And one of them is something I want to share with you in a minute. And that is sometimes when we go on a family holiday or sometimes for a day out, we go to the fairground. We go to fairgrounds and, and have some fun. And it was a place I really enjoyed going. So one of my favourites was the hook a duck, where you have a rod and you've got a duck, you try and hook it. Um, and if you're lucky and do really well, you get to win a goldfish in a little plastic bag. You probably remember those days. I absolutely love candy floss. Really unhealthy, but there you go. And I really enjoyed eating the toffee off the toffee apple and then leaving the apple alone and not touching it. I've never quite understood bumper cars when they tell you, oh, you're not allowed to hit the other cars with your car. But they're called bumper cars for a reason, I would cry out, and I want to hit other cars with the car that I was driving. Crooked House always was a great laugh, the sort of one where you've got weird wall shapes and stuff, and it plays tricks on your mind and you start bumping into things. But my firm favourite, without any doubt at all, is the Hall of Mirrors. That great place where you start walking in, and first of all you see a good picture of yourself and you think, yep, that's great. And then you move on, the next one makes you look really tall and really slim, and you think, if only. And the next one you look very short and very stubby. After a while your head is stretched in weird directions and your body's in S shapes and things like that. Various mirrors give you an odd and distorted view of yourself, and I thought that was hilarious, especially when you looked at other people's reflection as well. But it does make me think, how am I reflecting Jesus? How am I reflecting Jesus? Over the last couple of years, we've thought much about how we reflect Jesus to the people around us. How are we doing that? Are we giving the world a good view of Jesus, or is the view that the world sees through us disjointed? Is it a view that the world sees as distorted? So they don't really get to see the true Jesus. Well, in these verses we're going to look at, we're going to see that Stephen gave people a clear image, a clear reflection of Jesus. So much so that you could actually read most of this, but these few verses and replace Stephen's name with Jesus. So close was the reflection that Jesus had on Jesus. But first, before we really get into it, I just think we need to, to cover a few little things. Verse 9 gives us a list of people who are going to cause Stephen a whole heap of trouble. But who are they? Let's just understand who these people are. So the first one that tells us is the freeman. The freeman. The freeman was a blanket slave for Jews than their descendants. So if you go back to the first century BC, the Roman general Pompey captured some Jews, he enslaved them, took them back to Rome in order to be slaves for him. But these Jewish slaves, so dedicated were they to their, what they believed, 
So close do they keep to, work, to not working on the Sabbath or adhering to kosher law that they actually became completely useless as slaves. So Popem released them and they went back. And the freemen are the descendants of those type of slaves and other slaves from the Jewish nations as well. Cyrenians, they're from Cyrene in modern day Libya. And the Alexandras are from Alexandria in Egypt. And at the time of this being written and described, both cities had very, very large Jewish populations. Sicilia is a province on the south coast of modern day Asia Minor. And Tarsus, where Paul came from, is also from that area which is now the south coast of Turkey. And Asia, in this context, refers to the western province and part of also modern day Turkey. So that's the people that were going to cause him a most of problems. But who is Stephen? Who is this man, Stephen? Well, Stephen was ordained by the apostles to serve on the tables to be the equivalent of a deacon. And if anybody, if anybody was going to be able to get away with the situation that they were in, it was going to be Stephen. If Stephen wanted to stay out of the crossfire, Stephen had the great excuse because everybody would have been happy with Stephen serving and looking after and distributing goods to the widows. It was a job that everybody appreciated, everybody thought was a good thing to do, so he could have just kept his head down and cracked on doing that job. Persecution increases, and even a better time now for Stephen to keep his head down, stay in the background. We know that Stephen was far more than just a good servant. He was an ambassador for Christ, and keeping his head down was not an option as far as he was concerned. So much so that Luke wrote about Stephen with deep appreciation for the the spark and the joy and the enthusiasm that he brought to the growth of the church in Acts. So this section, when they read this, would have emboldened the church, their original readers, and reflected on their ministry. It gave them the first martyr of the new covenant. It would have been a sober reminder of one man who was used by God and had a great influence and impact at that time. It reminds me of men like Jim Elliot and David Brainard. These sort of men and many others as well, and women who bought one-way tickets, if you like, to the mission field. These people who packed all their possessions in in a coffin and thought, I'm never going to come back home, so I'll just take what I've got and go. One-way tickets to a mission field. See, like the original audience that this was written to, we also can enjoy and be emboldened and be encouraged by Stephen's story. In fact, the church, going back many generations, has listened and read of the martyrs, and it's emboldened the church. It's made the church stronger as well. And personally, if you want to read one of the best, I would recommend you read Five English Reformers, still available on the Banner of Truth if you want to get hold of a copy. So there we have the people who are going to be the opposition to Stephen. We have Stephen, who Stephen is. For this morning, we're going to look at three points. Three points. We're going to look at the boldness of Stephen... We're going to look at the accusations that Stephen faced. And we're going to look lastly at the face of an angel. So firstly, the boldness of Stephen. So in verse 8, it tells us that Stephen was filled with grace and power. And if we go back a few verses, in verse 3, he was filled with the Spirit and wisdom. And in verse 5, he was filled with faith and the Holy Spirit. So we can be sure and certain that Stephen's life was full of spirit and full of wisdom and grace and truth. Not just was this shown by the signs and wonders that he did, but much, much more than that, by the character that he showed, by the wisdom that he showed, as he went against the opposition and interacted with the opposition. So remember that that synagogue of Freeman was multicultural. There were Greek-speaking Jews, and they would have been mightily offended by what Stephen was having to say. They put it as a betrayal on themselves, Stephen being a Jew and now becoming a Christian. They would have seen that as a real affront and a betrayal of their people. It's also possible that that Saul's family attended this synagogue as well in this area. Paul, probably not, because in Philippians 3 it tells us that he was a Hebrew of Hebrews, so he would have gone to a Hebrew-speaking synagogue. But at the very least, we know that Saul was very happy to see the violent approach to Stephen's opposition and also his martyrdom and death that we read about in the next chapter. The Spirit spoke through Stephen, just as Jesus said it would in Luke 21. It says, For I will give you a mouth and wisdom 
which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. And that's what happens when we're full of faith and truth and grace and power. The Holy Spirit comes upon us and all the other things that are contrary to his characteristics are emptied out of our minds and hearts. So to be full of the Holy Spirit is to be emptied of self-importance. To be full of grace is to be emptied of self-justification, trying to get something out of the good things that you do. To be full of power is to be emptied of self-weakness. And to be full of faith is to be emptied of self-doubt. So if this is overwhelming to you, then I'm absolutely delighted. And the reason being is it's something that we're not naturally inclined to do, and I am way out of my comfort zone. So I hope I'm not the only one to feel like that. The reason Stephen was full of grace and full of power was because God filled him with grace and power. The reason that he was filled with the Holy Spirit and faith was because God filled him with the Holy Spirit and power. The reason that he was full of all these things was because God gave him the ability. God enabled Stephen and he will enable us. God will provide the boldness and strength that we need. However, however, we need to understand that our obedience to the commission in Matthew 28 to go into all the world does not depend on God emboldening us first. We don't sit here on a Sunday thinking, I must go and talk to my people at work or somewhere around and just sit here waiting for the, for the taps of boldness, if you like, to be turned on so that we'll be filled and be able to go out and do it. No, sometimes we have to obey in faith, trusting that God will enable us on the way. So sometimes the feeling of the Holy Spirit emboldening us follows rather than precedes obedience. Sometimes it's only after the event, after we have done that, that we can actually see the Holy Spirit working in our hearts and in our lives. So it's like the song that we just sang, we walk by faith and not by sight. It means that if you trust that God will work with you and through you with what he requires you to do. It means that the gospel is not just informational, but transformational. Stephen's was full of grace, faith, wisdom and power. And they were a beautiful, perfect reflection of the character and attributes of Jesus. Jesus' teaching had exactly the same effect as Stephen's teaching. The mouths of his opposition were silenced. The wisdom which, which Stephen spoke of is the same wisdom of Jesus. In Matthew 12 and in Luke 12, 11, it says that this wisdom was greater than the wisdom of Solomon. Just cast your mind to Luke chapter 2. Jesus was in the temple at the age of 12. And it says these words. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to the custom. And when the feast was ended, and as they were returning, the boy stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting with the teachers, listening to them and asking questions. And all who heard were amazed at his understanding and his answers. In Mark 1, Jesus was talking to the scribes, and it says, and they were astonished at his teaching, because he taught them with one who had authority. Luke 4 says, they were astonished at his teaching. His words possessed authority. On so many occasions, Jesus showed wisdom in how he dealt with people and their arguments. But he also showed boldness, just like Stephen did as well. So Matthew 12 says, You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? Jesus speaking to the Pharisees, the church leaders of the day. Matthew 21, And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables and the money changers and the seats who sold pigeons. And he said to him, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer. You make it into a den of robbers. See, Stephen and Jesus were certainly not shy at speaking the truth. I'll take a big gulp here. We know that there are many people who lead churches who do not hold to what the Bible teaches. <coughs> Would you be bold enough to turn to that person and said, how can you speak good when you are evil? It's a huge challenge, isn't it? How do we go about teaching and sharing the good news of the gospel of Christ to those who are actually teaching a false gospel. Jesus and Simon were not, sorry, Stephen were not shy in speaking the truth. 
How are we? Are we bold in proclaiming the unsearchable Christ, uh, riches of Christ? Are we standing up firm for the gospel? I don't know if you've noticed, but at the bottom of uh, Christian's emails that he sends out, it has Isaiah verse, chapter 7, verse 9 on it, which is, if you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand firm at all. So we need to make sure that we stand firm against any opposition that comes our way. But we can only do this with the same help that Stephen and Jesus had. And that's through the work and help of the Spirit in our lives. There's no other way it can be done. So first we've got the boldness of Stephen. Secondly, we've got the accusations that Stephen faced in 11 to 14. See, these people were unable to defeat the superior wisdom that Stephen had at this point. So now they're turning to the dark side. They're turning to fraud, to bribery. They began slinging mud, spreading rumours and lies about Stephen. See, Stephen wasn't seized and arrested because of the wonders he was doing. He was seized and arrested because of the message that he proclaimed. They accused him of speaking blasphemous words against Moses and God and against the temple and the law in verses 11 and 13. Our saviour Jesus, he was accused of exactly the same thing. Didn't he not say that he would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days? Referring to his body. He referred to a greater one than the temple would come. He spoke similarly about the fulfilment of the law, that both the temple and the law foreshadowed what Christ was going to do. This wasn't blasphemy against Moses or God. He wasn't speaking against the temple or the law. He was proclaiming that he was the fulfilment of those things. It was what he pointed to. And this teaching landed Jesus on the cross. And it was going to do something very, very similar to Stephen. So we know John 15 tells us that a servant is not above his master. Stephen knew the risk, but he cared more about the gospel and the glory of God and the salvation of his audience than his own life. Amazing, the Spirit of God enables Stephen to love his enemies more than himself. So in Luke 6, 27 and 28, it says, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who persecute you, pray for those who abuse you. You know, whether we like it or not, we are in spiritual warfare. There's a spiritual battle going on all around us, and every day sinners are stepping a, that little bit closer to judgment. Jonathan Edwards said these words, unconverted people walk over a pit of hell on a rotten covering. At any point, they might slip and fall into everlasting torment. So the question is, who's going to tell them? Who's going to warn them? Yes, I admit, I would like to stay in the background sometimes. I would like to stay quiet. I think I'd like to hide myself away, but really we shouldn't and we can't. We possess the only remedy for the condition that they are in. Those in danger might be family members, co-workers, bosses, employees, friends, neighbours, strangers even. Do we really care about their salvation? Do we care about what happens to them in eternity? See, our commitment to the glory of God should not make us complacent. Rather, we should feel a sense of a holy discontentment, if you like, when God's glory is snuffed out by unbelief. You know, I have to confess, I struggle to even desire what Stephen and Paul and others had. I struggle to desire the, the salvation of others sometimes. I like to hunker down. I like to feel safe. I don't want to put my head above the parapet sometimes. But we need to give, ask God to give us a heart for the lost. We need to pray that he will give us a heart that's deeper than our own desire for safety and more for the people who are going to lost eternity. So we've looked at the boldness of Stephen, the accusations that Stephen had in front of him, and now this phrase, face of an angel, in verse 15. Now, we learn a lot by looking at people's facial expressions. You talk to a little child, and they put their, their hands over their face and do peekaboo as if by covering their eyes, they then become invisible to everyone around them. Facial expressions are hugely important. 
You can tell if someone's cross or angry or happy or sad or joyful or rejoicing just by looking at their face. They don't need to say anything. You get that straight away from them. Even now it goes further, doesn't it? You look at your phone and your phone opens up by recognising your face. You go through passport control and it's all done electronically by what your face looks like. You have security passes to go into different faces of security just by looking at your face and it opens doors and things like that for you. Your face is massively important. Stephen hadn't yet opened his mouth and preached to the council, but they saw his angelic face. It's not often this sort of phrase is mentioned in God's word. Remember Moses coming down from Mount Sinai with his face glowing, revealing that he'd been with God in Exodus 34? Maybe Stephen's face was shining just like that as well. John Stott says on this, in this way God was showing that both Moses' ministry of the law and Stephen's interpretation of the law had his approval. So the reason that Stephen was able to respond as he did, the reason that Stephen looked as he did was because he spent time in the presence of God. It means he was a man of prayer and a man of the word. Stephen's face revealed and reflected the character of God to the people. God's approval was clearly upon him and what was about to happen. He was full of grace and power and wisdom and the spirit. And his angelic face was a representation of God's approval on him. This partly explains the wisdom that Stephen had. And it also helps us understand what was going to happen in the next chapter as it covers Stephen's amazing speech and his godly death. God's approval was on the sermon that Stephen was about to preach. And in some ways, it's so very, very easy to tell the gospel message. So it's all about just knowing God and making him known to others. It's about sin and the devastating effect it can have on everyone. It's about explaining that the only solution for the sin is Jesus Christ. Sometimes we just find it so hard. And I think we just have to be honest with ourselves that we find it so hard because sometimes we try and do it in our own strength. Not asking for the grace and wisdom and power and faith that comes from God. So the grace that we had should lift our concerns for the glory of God to a new height and for the salvation of people above any of our own reputation. But how about Jesus? We said that Stephen reflects Jesus. How about Jesus? Take your mind to Matthew 17, the transfiguration. It says that Jesus' face shone like the sun at that transfiguration. What about in Revelation 1, John wrote there and he said, Then I turned to the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands was one like the Son of Man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. His hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flaming fire. His feet was like burnished bronze refined in the furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his hands he held seven stars, from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in all its strength. Our Saviour's face shone like the sun in all its glory. How's your face doing? Not interested in whether you've got makeup on this morning or, or how you thought when you looked in the mirror or whether you put your creams on or anything like that, but how's your face looking? Is it reflecting Jesus? Is your face seeking to do what we want to do and stop giving glory to God? Are we spending time with him in prayer and in his words so it shows in our face? You know, it doesn't often happen, but it has happened a couple of times me when someone's been interviewed on television and you just hear the words that they say and think, oh, I wonder if they're a Christian. And then they say, oh, I believe in God. Sometimes it does happen. Sometimes just by what they say or the way they look or the way they react to something, you can just get the pressure, oh, yeah, there's something different about them. See, no matter where we are in our life, no matter what we are doing in our life, nothing, absolutely nothing, is more important than the glory of God. So where does that leave us? How do we pull this all together? How do we build ourselves up and give ourselves confidence? Well, I hope that it does actually build ourselves up and give us confidence, even though we might feel a sense of trepidation sometimes about what God is asking us to do. You see, Stephen's just been seized... He's been falsely accused of speaking blasphemy. 
We have enough. The opposition now has moved beyond the Sanhedrin into the Jewish synagogues and even into the streets. And we know that very soon Stephen is about to lose his life. Yes, Stephen appears completely at peace. In the next chapter, they're going to let him respond to the accusations and he will preach the longest, most powerful sermon recorded in the Acts. And very soon after that, he's going to be executed. Why? Because the glory of God was the most important thing in Stephen's life. So in the next chapter in Acts 7, it says these words. When they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. But Stephen full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven, saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And as they were stoning Stephen to death, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Said that Stephen reflected Jesus. Luke 23, this tells us how Jesus felt the salvation of man was more important than his own suffering. Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And they came to the place that is called the skull. There they crucified him. Criminals on his right and one on the left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. There is one who gave up absolutely everything for you and me and for the world outside. He gave up his riches, he gave up his family, he gave up glory, he gave up power. Philippians 2 says he emptied himself, making himself nothing, taking the form of a servant and becoming obedient unto death, even death on a cross. For you and me. How are you reflecting Jesus? Are you reflecting Jesus accurately? Are you reflecting Jesus as you should do? Or is actually the world seeing a completely distorted, weird image of Jesus? Perfect Son of Man paid the price for your salvation and my salvation. As as Hebrews 2 said, it was in order to bring us to glory. As we close, I don't know about you, but I feel completely inadequate now. I feel like this is just an impossible task that we've been asked to do. We need to pray. We need to pray that God will give us the the idea of this grace, that it will raise our concerns for the glory of God above anything else, above our own reputation or above our own safety, above our own job or own life, whatever it is, that the glory of God and the salvation of other people just is much more important than anything else. Jesus died for salvation for men and women. Stephen died telling the story of how Jesus can save. Are we going to hide away? Are we going to bury our head in the sand and pretend that we're not really getting involved? Or are we, as the text says in Isaiah, we're going to stand firm and teach and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to all those that would listen? Let's just pray. Father, we do thank you for this man, Stephen. We thank you that he beautifully reflected the character of Jesus Christ. That he was willing to stand up and be counted. That he was willing to teach the truth, no matter what the consequences could be. We know that even at the end of his life, he was able to cry out, forgive them. Father, this just reminds us of that wonderful time on the cross when Jesus cried out, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. So as we started this service asking for your forgiveness for the sins that we commit, Father, we would end in the same way. Because we constantly need your forgiveness. We constantly need your emboldening in our lives. We constantly need our faith deepened. We constantly need to be given better wisdom. We constantly need all these things so that we may go out and do what Matthew 28, 20 says, to go into all the world and teach and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to those that would listen. So, Father, we pray, please, that as we go into a new week, no matter what that week will be in front of us, that we may hold on to what you've asked us to do, that we may take it seriously, this commission that you've given us, that we will wait upon the Holy Spirit to embolden us and give us what we need as we go out and proclaim this amazing message. And maybe, just maybe, 
When we return together to come worship and praise you, we'll be able to share of times when we've stepped out in faith and you have been faithful in what has happened. So, Father, we thank you for what we have learnt this morning. We pray that you'll bless it to us in Christ's name. Amen. You know, when we look at things like this, we have to say that, how do we do these things? And this last hymn helps us, yet not I, but through Christ in me. What beautiful words, what gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. I labour on in weakness, but I rejoice. To this I hold my shepherd will defend me. The future sure, the price has been paid. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus. Strong words, aren't they? For he has said that he will bring me home, and day by day I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne. Let's come and sing, yet not I, but through Christ in me.
Our Father, we, we pray that when it comes to that point, that we will see heaven opened. We will see the glory of God. We will see Jesus standing at the right hand of the God. The heavens opened, and the Son of Man. And that we will cry out, Father, forgive those that have been bad against us as we fall asleep. Father, we do not know what the world is going to throw at us. We do not know what's going to happen even this week, let alone in the months and years to come. But Father, we pray, please, that you will enable us to stand firm, to stand firm on this amazing gospel of Jesus Christ, and that we'll take seriously our commission to go out and tell others that the salvation and the glory of God may be higher and more important than anything that the world can do to us. Father, by ourselves, we cannot do this. By ourselves, we are weak and feeble. So we rely on your strength to embolden us to be able to do this great commission. Help us, we pray, in your name. Amen.